think the fact that we're all sitting down in the room suggests that we're all scared of Simona. <laughs> Since she threatened us to be here by 28 after. Uh, and I'm going to assume that that means we can start the webinar as well. Yes? Very good. All right, I want to welcome you all to the webinar today. This is the seventh webinar that the WHO Migrant and Refugee Department team has put on this year. They all focus on, obviously, different health issues to do with migrants and refugees. I want to welcome you all who are online. Uh, welcome to the school. This is a school that's been going on all week long. It is the WHO School on Refugee and Migrant Health. It is the second year in a row. Uh, that WHO has put on this school to bring together some of the best experts in the world to talk about how we can better promote health issues and health access to migrants and refugees. This particular webinar is going to talk about winds of change and we're going to look forward to the future of refugee and migrant health in Europe. All week long we've been pulling together a variety of issues talking about the multi-dimensional aspects of getting health care and health access uh, to refugees and migrants. So for the next 90 minutes, we're going to look forward. Uh, we're going to look forward with some of the people here on this panel who are indeed uh, experts in their particular area. Now, a webinar is no fun if you don't participate. So I'm going to take just a moment and tell you how you can do that. If you are online and are watching this on your computer, simply scroll down a little bit from where you're watching this and you will see a box. The platform that we use for you to participate is called Slido. If you're on your computer, you can just type your question in that box, hit send, and it will go into the queue on this end. If you are watching this on a mobile phone or if you are sitting in this room, you need to download the Slido app. When you download that, you will need a code, and it is hashtag KHHM for Knowledge Hub on the health of migrants, hashtag K-H-H-M, and they do give you the hashtag, so they make it easy for you. So go ahead and download that, because then you can see all the questions that are coming in. And there's two different ways you can participate on that app. You can actually push questions up the queue. You will see a list of questions as they come in. One of them may be yours, if you add your question there. If you think it's a good question and you would like to know the answer to it, simply hit the thumbs up sign and it will push it up the queue and you can cut in front of everybody else and get your question asked or get the question that you want asked. You can also tweet from that platform and we strongly encourage you to do so. We need some activity on the Twitter page for this. The has hashtag for this school is hashtag Migration Health School. Hashtag Migration Health School. So we want to encourage you to do both of those as well, and that gets you involved. But we really do want you to jump in and ask some questions of these participants. Now, the way that we're going to work this for the next 90 minutes is we are going to listen to each of these fine folks up here. Uh, one at a time, they will add a few comments, contribute to each other, and then we will open the floor for questions. So we're going to give them each about five minutes to give us some of their thoughts so we know what the breadth of their questioning is. And uh, then we will open up the floor for questions. When I do take questions, I will take questions three at a time so that we can get to as many as possible. We'll work both online and in the room here. So let's get underway. I think I've covered all of the admin. Let me just look at my list real quick. Yeah, that looks like it. All right, we're going to start with Dr. Alan Krasnick. He is a professor of public health at the University of Copenhagen, a senior researcher at the Danish Research Center for Migration, Ethnicity, and Health, and president of the Section of Migrant and Ethnic Minority Health in the European Public Health Association. His research has been focusing on healthcare reforms, migrant health and equity in access and use of health services in Denmark and internationally, and he will speak to some of the trends and challenges in Europe at the moment. Alan, go ahead. Thank you very much for this uh, kind uh, introduction, and thank you very much to WHO for organizing this uh, exciting event, which I've been looking very much forward to uh, participate in. First, I would like to tell you that I'm actually quite worried. Uh, sometimes I'm, uh, I'm even... Uh, sad and sometimes I'm quite angry. And why? Because I think and I observe changes in uh, our Europe, in my country, Denmark, and in European countries, 
which I don't really like. Changes where we are reintroducing new poverty, more inequity, new kinds of health and social problems that we haven't seen for a long time. I think that since the Second World War, we have experienced increasing welfare, improving health, reducing inequity. First of all, of course, because of uh, economical growth, but also to some extent because the principle that was ruling before for providing social and health services was changed. Before, often the main principle was deservedness. People had to deserve their uh, access to social services, to health services, and uh, only those who had the formal or high status in society <coughs> or the ability to pay, which was often uh, the, the combined uh, characteristics of the same groups, uh, only these had access to services, to quality services. But uh, this changed uh, and entitlements were the basis, common entitlements for everyone. And uh, there is a tendency now to back, uh, to, to return to deservedness as the main principle. Uh, and partly, I think, because of the migration issues and the policy issues related to migration. And this will have effects for certain. Um, we'll see that poverty will grow again for in some groups, that inequities will uh, increase. And uh, we'll see that, and we already see that to some extent, for instance, among uh, families with children. Some of these live uh, under very poor conditions with not much um, uh, resources, uh, not much hopes for their children to um, attain uh, reasonable education, employment, um, a future that is comparable to the majority of the population. And we also can use the example of the elderly, uh, especially elderly migrants, who uh, due to their um, reduced um, time of stay in the country have very limited financial uh, possibilities. Their pension is small, <clears throat> their support from the state is small, much smaller than that, which counts for the majority. So we know from history that these kind of situations create <clears throat> health problems, <clears throat> and if you are not <clears throat> concerned with health problems, it will certainly create future costs. And it also creates tensions in society, tensions between groups, tensions in uh, the population in general. <clears throat> we have been backed during the last 50, 60 years by international conventions, international declarations and agreements, statements. Um, but uh, if we look into reality, there are large gaps between these conventions and declarations and statements which provide rights and entitlements uh, great gaps between those and what is happening in uh, national and local policies and practices. <clears throat> and I think there is a need to act, to act uh, in support of the migrants and these, these uh, groups which are now getting into more um, a difficult situation and in order to prevent societies to fall apart. I think we as health professionals, health managers, we have a special responsibility. From history, we have seen that uh, health workers, health professionals, medical doctors have been uh, speaking out and trying to, to uh, react to this kind of problems and have actually supported improvements. You might think that um, this uh, picture of our societies and the future of our societies is somehow a bleak nightmare far from reality. And if so, I hope you are right. Uh, and uh, I think we all have a responsibility 
to make sure that uh, this is not uh, this is not reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. You, you, if I can ask just one follow-up question, um, you did a really nice job of painting the picture for us on the growing inequities and the gaps. And I'm wondering if you could talk for just a second, possibly, about some kinds of initiatives that exist to help health professionals kind of bridge this gap a little bit, if you will. Well, there are many ways of, 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 ac of many ways for action, in, I think, for, for, for health professionals. Um, first of all, uh, they could uh, become more clearly witnesses to what is going on. They see reality, they meet the patients, they uh, see the consequences of social uh, issues turning into health problems. So speaking out on behalf of the groups, um, use their channels, professional channels, uh, and also, like we talked about in the last uh, session before lunch, um, take part in providing evidence, documentation, stop being silent witnesses, but being real witnesses, communicating what they see. And then I think also professionals could uh, more actively um, reject harmful initiatives. We have an example from the UK where doctors are asked to check uh, the legal situation of patients in order to, to ensure that they have the formal rights. I don't think this is a job for doctors. And I think this should be sharply uh, rejected. And finally, I think uh, <clears throat> that health professionals have very good channels to link with communities. They are working in communities and they might have very good channels also to, um, to uh, react and link to uh, local policy makers and uh, leaders in uh, the local society who have the power to change reality. It's a real call to action you're giving them, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the strength of your comments there. Uh, let me go now to Santino Severoni, somebody that really needs uh, no introduction this week since we've uh, barely let him off the stage <laughs> this week. Uh, but in case you're online and don't know who he is, he is the coordinator of public health and migration at the WHO Regional Office for Europe, the person that really is the driver of this school. He's going to speak to us for just a moment about the global agenda and tools for migration and health. Santino, over to you. Well, I would like to start speaking about the regional agenda where I'm working with. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I want to make a preamble. Um, too often, uh, since we are among experts, too often when we are talking about migration health or refugees health, we tend to focus on the problems. We are doctors, you know, we see everything medicalized. Uh, in my short intervention, I want to focus on positive things because we need hope and we need courage in these days to keep changing the situation. Because indeed, the reading of the situation in the European region is of uh, a region which is on the move to, to steal a, a, a word from migration. Uh, when we started uh, the WHO European region to work on migration health was 2011. Before that, we used to touch upon cross-cutting issues while addressing inequities or social determinants, but never really approaching the issue in a systematized way with a fully-fledged, programmatic, strategic approach. That's the first revolution happened in the region, and this has been spreading around uh, in an epidemic, in viral uh, way, to other regions, and globally. Uh, we do a lot of work hand-in-hand -hand with the other offices uh, composing the organization, in particular at Quarter. We uh, offer all our experiences and uh, production in order to accelerate the changes. What do I mean with a, with a region on the move? When we started working on this in 2011, people were scared, were overwhelmed by numbers, made giant by media, but then in absolute terms, they were just small numbers and could be just uh, handled as it happened. Um, knocking at the door of the Ministry of Health, eight times out of 10, we were receiving the reply, but this is not my business. Why are you coming to me? Uh, if we're going to have an outbreak, if we're going to have a health crisis, uh, please count on us, but now what should I do? Then explaining the situation, say, oh my God, but here I need to sit in front of 
big chops of the government, which they hold all the power, how to do that. So what happened, we set up a process hand in hand with our member states to really show the path and ourselves in a very humble way, learning from the country situation. Never missing the opportunity to learn and keep in adding the experience of countries to our, our work. While the country experience were packaged and then sell out at the international level, helping us to send up standards and, and, and uh, standard operating procedures. The result of that is that this region, in a moment of uh, political and mediatic uh, major complexity on this topic, 2015, there are colleagues here from the Balkans, only them, they know what does it mean to see uninterrupted queue of people walking across a region, all of them aiding to Northern Europe. And uh, in that context, uh, something happened that having this dialogue open with the member states, we understood was a time to act. So we call all member states, we consulted with all of them, with all partners, stakeholders, and we convinced them as long we are talking about facts, we are talking about solid public health and health arguments, there is no political polarization that can challenge what we are talking about. This is a privilege given to doctors, to public healthers, by our job, that wherever is the context, if we are talking about facts, nobody can challenge that, regardless the political vision, the political view, and so on. And the result is that this region loaded himself a uh, few years ago of a first ever strategy and action plan that this year celebrate the second year of implementation, and here we come with a new surprise, with my colleagues uh, collecting data from countries and struggling to analyze those data, I said, God help us what we're going to get out of this political situation. And again, over surprised, so we must to be positive, because almost roughly 50% of the countries, they start to silently implementing or mainstreaming policies, the strategies into their own national and regional policies, setting up services, investing to capacity, and the school is one of the result of that. Um, in the, 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 the aim of the session is what is the future, what is the forecast for the future? Uh, this is business unfinished. I'm not celebrating any, any, any goal achieved. It, we are just at the beginning of a wonderful journey, hopefully, and uh, we need to keep going on because the target is 100%, not 50%. The target is really changing our region. Uh, the target is escalating uh, seriously, massively collaboration with Middle East region, African region. So really to create a movement and to uh, establish a solid network of champion countries which they can share their experiences to their own uh, neighboring countries and other countries around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santino. And I want to dig a little bit on that business unfinished, uh, if I can do that very quickly. Uh, you know, you're right. You, you summed up very nicely WHO's convening power and trailblazing power in getting the strategy rolled out. Um, but I'm curious, looking forward, uh, what we can take from the past. Um, what lessons have you learned in the global community? And, and, and what have you learned to advise people on how to operationalize uh, the global action plan going forward. I'd like to reply to you with a, uh, a reply that a uh, distinguished uh, friend, a representative of an African country, when we were talking about migration health in, during the Walter Tassim in Geneva a few years ago, told to me, but this is a European business. So the unfinished business is that it's not true. It's everybody's business, and the small uh, of our region, for example, we consider to be priority to escalate collaboration with Central Asian countries, uh, CIS countries, Russian-speaking countries. Today, there was a wonderful session on uh, evidence and research and so on. And imagine our region, we are having half of the country doing research in a language and we are not able to read what they are doing. Or we are not offering to them enough opportunity to share in their own language what they are doing. Just an example. I can uh, keep going on, uh, the elements of NCD, the elements of uh, uh, then analyzing, dissecting the experience done so far to correct our evidence or to correct our actions. This is still at very early stage which require 
to keep the efforts intense and constant. So in that spirit, it really is a global agenda and, and global tools, as we were talking earlier this week about how it is an international uh, effort. All right, um, thank you, Santino. I want to turn now to Dominique Zenner. He is the Senior Migration Health Advisor for IOM's Regional Office for the European Economic Area, the EU, and NATO. Uh, previously, Zenner worked with the National TB Section in Public Health in England, and he's going to speak to health as a human right in the Global Compact on Migration and the role of IOM and all of that. <laughs> Dominique. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I would like to thank you for um, inviting IOM to this panel and also um, like to uh, thank you, Santino, and everybody else in WHO of arranging this wonderful um, summer school in this wonderful location, which I agree is a sign of actually, you know, investing in something that is, is really good in migration and health. Um, let me also say that I'm here on behalf of uh, Federico Soda, who is our chief of mission in Italy, who uh, has, uh, is unable uh, to attend, unfortunately. Okay, let me uh, start on the positive vein, actually, of Santino. Um, so, I'm a doctor, health is a human right, and I don't think there is any contention around that kind of thing, or shouldn't be, actually. And that's actually enshrined in a number of documents. In, um, it's also in the Global Compact. Um, and if we look at the WHO agenda of Dr. Tedros, you know, universal healthcare coverage, UHC, is very much um, a, a WHO um, a initiative. And, um, and, is, uh, and migration health is essential to in be included in UHC. You cannot have UHC without migration health. It's simply impossible. Um, so, um, we have actually, um, uh, we are supporting as IOM and uh, in the international community, um, uh, the uh, um, WHO global, um, uh, sorry, the regional action plan, um, which we just heard about. Um, and um, I'm going to give a couple of examples. Uh, for one is uh, the strategic area nine, which is about health information systems. And so uh, we, uh, IOM has of course supported the uh, European Commission funded um, uh, electronic personal health record system, which facilitates, um, uh, f facilitates um, exchange of health information between countries and therefore integration. So um, I've got basically four points I wanted to make in this. Uh, what, you know, when I looked at this uh, agenda, I thought, what are the, the things that we can do into the future? And four things came to my mind. One is uh, to work to practically improve entitlement and access to healthcare. And that ensures, um, so that, that includes, and we heard a lot about that this week, uh, a people-centered, um, linguistically and culturally appropriate um, services that meet the needs of the migrant. Let me say it again, let me say it a few times. UHC is not possible without including migrants. Secondly, to ensure that migrants are part of the routine surveillance and monitoring systems that we normally use, that they don't, you know, uh, they're, they're not an extra statistics. We are including them into those uh, things. Um, then also to ensure that we build uh, systems, to ensure that vulnerabilities are in, uh, appropriately met um, in accordance, of course, uh, with uh, EU directives and uh, on asylum seekers and other relevant uh, legislations. And that means also to understand that vulnerabilities are, of course, um, you know, often a product of circumstances. And fourthly and lastly, to contribute to a positive discourse on migration and uh, my friend Alan has uh, um, so wonderfully said it, I don't need to repeat it all, but it's uh, close to my heart too. That means emphasizing the contribution of migrants. For example, in um, not only economically, we all talk about that, but also scientifically, or also thinking about care workers and healthcare workers, which are migrants. Okay, um, so uh, and making sure that uh, migration health is part of all these debates that are going on. Global development and health debate, for example, the global migration and development debate, just to name it, a couple. I think there is an urgency for us, for all of us, to come together in a highly coordinated fashion to do these kind of things. Um, because we all have synergistic and um, but slightly different strengths and mandates, um, which th these can be optimized for results, I think. So we have to be efficient to avoid 
uh, duplication of results and ensure that all the aspects are being covered. And um, IOM, of course, um, is, um, is quite uniquely placed, and I wanted to um, spend one or two words on what IOM can contribute to this. Um, so the first thing is, of course, uh, we talked about the Global Compact, um, which uh, we are all looking to Marrakesh in December um, for, um, for the uh, uh, coming into power. Um, there will be um, a UN network on migration, and I think that um, IOM will be charged with the... Uh, um, with the uh, secretariat uh, of, of that. Um, UN, so the IOM is the UN migration agency, obviously, and so therefore it's, it's dealing primarily with the movement aspect of migration. Um, and health needs to be and is uh, an essential part of this. Um, so that means, dealing with the movement aspect, that IOM <coughs> has got um, close relationships with some of the other actors, for example, border agencies, for example, ministries of interior, that we really need in order to, uh, to, to make a difference. But also, of course, it does have um, a deep and uh, long experience for over 65 years of health programs and policy engagements and in, in our uh, migrant health uh, department, migration health division, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to end by just um, giving um, about five things that we, um, you know, to, to support the notion what we are contributing to this. So. Um, Currently, we are rolling out, for example, comprehensive uh, training of migration and health in 33 me member and accession states of the EU. Um, and uh, we're looking to intensify this aspect of training. So we're tra training the trainers, not only healthcare professionals, but also social workers and law enforcement officials. So that's one. Um, helping to advocate for healthcare, as I said before, I think this is crucial. So you all heard about the MIPEX, the uh, migration policy index, and I think to illustrate um, the, uh, what the entitlements are, what the different policies are, in order to try and change them, is crucial. Supporting collaborative research, um, focusing also on, on some of the um, thorny aspects, for example, um, the impact of migration of health professionals themselves onto the communities left behind, um, for example, in the Western Balkans, in the uh, Central Asian regions. Multifaceted protection response amongst the Syrian refugees in Turkey, so we ran a mobile outreach uh, and psychosocial support there. And of course, um, lastly, and I say this again, contributing to, um, to integration through the development um, and implementation of an electronic personal health record system, which I think in, helps to ensure the continuity of care uh, and avoids duplication of investigations. So there are many, many of obvious aspects of um, uh, collaboration between agencies, and we have ongoing and good relationships with stakeholders in the field, be it the, the um, state um, stakeholders, UN stakeholders such as WHO or UNHCR, um, um, but also in the academic world, uh, and I should name the Madri Research Network that we heard this morning. Um, my last sentence would be, I think we have to, um, we have a big responsibility. We have a responsibility to fill the uh, knowledge and research gap and to disseminate that. Um, and we're doing that. Um, uh, we're starting to do that. And the good news is, and, and I think a lot of things have happened, that, for example, the Lancet Commission is coming out later this year. The, the WHO Knowledge Hub, um, of course, the IOM Migration Health Research Net Network. I think we need to focus and strengthen these efforts um, to, to build the future that we like to see in migration health. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Okay, because I'm a communications person, I have an activity for everybody right now. I need you to go to Twitter, or if you're on Slido, there is a place you can tweet there. And I want you to tweet this. You cannot have universal health coverage without migrant health. Go ahead, you can actually get on your phone right now to do that. You cannot have universal health coverage, or if I'm not looking over your shoulder, you can type UHC without migrant health. And then I want the hashtag migration health school. See, if we do this really well, we can actually get that trending. And that would make Santino really, really happy, wouldn't it? And me.
<laughs> All right, there's your activity while I'm uh, going to dig a little bit here. Um, if, if I hear one thing rising to the surface from listening to you, it's integration, integration, integration. Am I, am I hearing the right message here pretty much? Um, my question is, you were talking about personal health records uh, just a moment ago, and, and perhaps it's a, a, a bit of a pro pro provocative question, but I, I'm curious, do you think, because we hear it both ways, information technology is helpful or harmful? migration Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. I think, um, obviously, um, as you heard, um, we are, um, IOM is uh, um, quite uh, interested and supportive of trying to build health information systems. Why? Of course, um, because it is almost a tool for integration, because basically what we're doing there is we're sharing um, records, um, we're sharing vaccination records or um, other health records, and we're making it um, uh, available to the next doctor to treat the patient. Also, you may know that in some countries, you may need ha uh, to have um, certain uh, prerequisites in order to uh, enter the health system. For example, in uh, the UK, you need an NHS number uh, to, to do so. So that's, that's another uh, thing. Of course, um, um, it's, it's a bit like um, a kitchen knife, right? Um, so if you've got a kitchen knife, you use it in the kitchen, um, it's good for your nurturing of your body. I mean, it's, it's obvious. But if you're um, in a gang in South London, it can become uh, a mortal instrument. And, and that's, um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Information technology is powerful and can be abused. And so, therefore, safeguards and, um, and encryption and uh, making sure that uh, data is only shared with the, with the people appropriate is essential. But it is important to emphasize that basically, I mean, the best way I can think of is um, I, uh, in my previous life, um, worked as a GP, as a general practitioner in East London, and as such, I um, um, also did out-of-hour services. And the revolution came when, in the out-of-hour services, we were actually able to access patient records from the routine GP records. Because you don't have to rely on the patient telling you he's got a penicillin allergy. You've got it there in front of you. It's as stark as that. It's very important, I think. So it is a tool uh, for, for uh, good. It needs to be carefully used. Um, but it is, uh, of course, um, uh, and it is a tool for integration, I think. Thank you, Dominique. I'm going to turn lastly to Michaela Toll. She is currently the Deputy Director of the Global Health Center, the Graduate Institute for International and Development Studies uh, in Geneva. Previously, she worked for the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. In part, during that time, she was responsible for the migration portfolio. Uh, she you kind of whet the appetite for what she's about to talk to us about, but it, it ties up what we've been talking about this week and this past 30 minutes quite well, and that is health and politics and the roles of individuals. Michaela, go ahead. Thank you, Gesti, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to be on this panel. So it's really a pleasure to be here. So let me start from a different point. Let me start from Benny and Mohamed. Benny is from Congo. She lives now in France, and she has a rare disease, which is trypanocytos. And she studied, she came to Europe to study. She came to Italy to study, she finished her studies in Italy. And because she has got that disease, and it was diagnosed and came out, so she thought, well, I crossed the border to France, I may have better chances in France to work in France and get treatment in France because of the history of France, France a little bit towards migrants and, and foreigners in the country. So there she is now, for 10 years, she's in France. She's an irregular migrant. She gets medical care, but she doesn't have a status, a legal status. There, she's an irregular migrant, and she's stuck in the system. Because she cannot go back home to DRC, because she wouldn't get any medical treatment back home because it, it requires her disease, her rare disease requires heavy treatment or, or medication which is not available. But she also cannot really work and enter the market because in France, because she has no legal status. So there is Benny. Now let's move to Mohamed. Mohamed is from Gambia and he is in Libya. So I'll tell you the story of Mohamed in his words. I think you should do something to explain to Europe what is happening in Libya. 
Over there is a Slater, Slater house, a hell from which it's very difficult to get out. There are no planes to fly back home. There are no buses or cars to drive me home. I can't go any direction. I can only cross the sea as the only way out. Before I, I was leaving, I had spent eight months in prison. And then they sold me to someone else, which meant another prison. Every day, someone came and beat us with an iron bar. And when I say us, I mean men, women, including pregnant women and children. Four of my friends who traveled with me were shot in front of my eyes, as if they were chickens. The worst thing is that nobody is accountable for it. So there we are, Mohammed and Benny. So I ask you, what is the future of Mohammed and Benny? Both are stuck in the system because in some ways Mohammed is also stuck in that system. He is. So what is the way out? And I think one way out is actually to realize that health and migration has a human face. Health is about people. It's about values. It's about dignity. Migration is about people. It's about values. It's about dignity. So we need to create an understanding that there is a complex issue at hand here because Mohammed and Benny, they do want to have a future and we need to help them to get that future. So we need to understand the complexity of the issue wherever we are. So we have talked about, yes, it is important to talk about access to health services. Yes, it is important to survive. Yes, it is important. And we have talked about the social determinants of health. Yes, it is important. About poverty, we have heard. But we also need to talk about the political determinants of health. So we need to talk about health being political. Health is political. And there's an interface, and we need to talk about that interface of health and politics. So how is that framed, that interface of health and politics? It's framed within an institutional environment. It's framed within a pol political culture and a political context. It's framed by different degrees and forms of power and different distribution of power. And it is framed by different interests and ideologies. So we need to dare to talk about that politics. We need to dare to talk about that intersection. And yes, Alan, you're right. We need to act politically. We need to act. And health professionals have to dare to talk about power. Because, you know, we don't dare to talk about power. We, we don't dare. But we need to understand that the political regime in which we are is actually determining the health inequities. So we need to change the political regime. We need to understand that we have governance mechanisms which are insufficient and it's not good enough. So it is nice and it's a breakthrough that we have a global compact at a, at a global level. But is that good enough? Will that be implemented? It has no value if it's not implemented. So we need to understand that we need to go far beyond. We need to act out of our comfort zone. So we actually need to understand that we do have a shared responsibility. <laughs> wow. That's my answer. <laughs> that was incredibly powerful. I, I hesitate to ask any follow-up question to that. Um, Thank you for that. Health and migration has a human face, values, dignity. Uh, very powerful. You, you ended on shared responsibility. And you started talking about that a bit. Uh, could you elaborate just a little bit more on that last piece in your mind as you see reflecting on everything you've heard here? What does shared responsibility look like? So how... Hmm. <laughs> what does shared responsibility mean? I think I would come back to what Alan has said. It's about political action. We need to dare to act. It's about a collective action. We need to create a window of opportunity to act. And we need to create a space 
to act. But what does it mean? It actually means because how do we get to change? We want to change. So change only we can get through political action. And it also means that we need to change perceptions, we need to change language, we need actually to change the political system. Because if you look at Europe today, how does, and here again, I'm really nice, we are just complimentary, Ellen, but if you look at that political system in Europe, how does it look like? Rise of nationalism, far-right parties, Switzerland 29%, Austria 26%, Denmark 21%, Sweden 17.6%, Italy 17%, and there you are. I can could, could go on and on and on about the far-right far political parties in the system here in Europe. We need to change the political system because they are the decision makers. They are making, they are making decisions. Politicians are making the decisions. So how can you get actually into a different sort of health services? How can you get there unless you change the system? Because where you have what we have here in Europe is really a system which is against migration and against, it's about racism, it's about xenophobia, it's about against foreigners. So we need to act but, and definitely we need to act. I think that shared responsibility is on different levels. So yes, it is on different levels. So it is at that global level, and we need to continue to act. But we also need to hold accountable member states. Like Mohammed has asked for that. Mohammed has asked for accountability. So let's hold accountability. So let's act at the global level. We need to act at the community level. We have heard that, so I don't need to dwell into that. But I think it has another level, and that's the individual level. We need to act on an individual level as, a, as well. And it's not just about the medical profession to act because they, in fact, can provide evidence. That's right, I agree. But we need to act because we need to act out of our silo. If we want to change, we need to go out of the silo. It's not just about within our silo. So if you work in the Ministry of Health, go and speak with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs officials. Go to talk to your diplomats to make them understand, to demystify with the information you have. And so we need to demand also that accountability, but we have to act at home. Because health ultimately starts at home. And migration starts at home. So we cannot just say, you know, ah, we talk about we need to do this, and politicians have to do that, and the community is so important, we need to work in the community. No, we as individuals need to act, and it's not about us acting in our professional expect, in our profession, medical profession or other profession. I think it's us about acting as citizens, as responsible citizens, where you actually talk to your neighbor, because we are all convinced here, we know what we are voting for. We know that we are voting for the right party, I hope. Um, but it's not about that. It's about our neighbor in my little village who doesn't vote the same way. And it's about convincing my neighbor in my village that he has power. He has voting power. And only that voting power can say, change the system. And only when we get together on that, I think, we are able to give a future to Mohammed and Benny. Thank you so much, Michaela. I appreciate it. I recognize I'm on the verge of abusing my uh, moderator prerogative by asking all the questions. So I'm going to open up the floor uh, to others and to those of you in the room and online. Remember, if you want to vote, I keep looking down because the questions are right here for me. It's not that I'm not looking at you. Uh, if you want to vote on these questions that are coming in, make sure you go to Slido and you can you can do a thumbs up and push the question that you want the answer to to the top of the queue. Uh, if you are in the room, you can also do the old-fashioned way and raise your hand, uh, and we will call on you that way. Here's the way this is going to work. I am going to call on three questions at a time so we can get through uh, as many questions as possible. Uh, panel, do not answer every single piece of every single question or we'll be here all night, and these nice people would like to leave when it's still sunshine. Um, pick out the pieces of the question that are relevant to your work, okay? And I will just turn to the panel and let you go through uh, the answers, but please just answer the pieces that are relevant to your work, okay? All right. Uh, let's start in the room. Questions in the room? Raise your hands. I'm going to assume that you are all on Slido and asking your questions there, so I'm going to sit down and read these off of Slido here. First question. What role do you see 
for the health sector in shaping migration policy agenda in the future? What role do you see for health sector in shaping migration policy in the future? And six people want to know the answer to this question. The second question, how would electronic health data be stored? I think this one's going to be for Dominique. Uh, what are the implications of health data being stored centrally on a government server? And six people also want to know the answer to that question. In the context of increasing, you know, I'm at that age where I need glasses for close up and glasses for far away and glasses for the middle and this is the middle and I don't have the middle glasses, so bear with me. In the context of increasing rationing of health services, budgetary constraints and so on, how can we sustainably provide services for migrants and refugees? In the context of increasing rationing of health services, budgetary constraints and so on, how can we sustainably provide services for migrants and refugees? Alan, shall we start with you? Yes, thank you. Well, these are really very relevant questions, and I would like to combine uh, the first question and the third question uh, on the, the role of health sector in shaping migration policies and the issue of uh, uh, increasing uh, um, uh, rationing healthcare and how do we cope with that when we de develop our health services. Uh, I would think that uh, the health sector can uh, support the general policies of our, our countries, which seem to focus a, very, a lot on integration, to make migrants work, to make migrants uh, part of society. That, that's kind of objectives. And in fact, sometimes and oftentimes, the opposite is happening. But I think as health uh, services, we are able to uh, demonstrate and to uh, push for uh, integration policies that take into account the health issues. Because health makes a difference for integration. And if people are not healthy, then uh, they have difficulties in uh, getting through education, getting uh, jobs, uh, and uh, serving as citizens in a society. And then when we are trying to cut down on budgets for health care, then uh, what about migrants? And uh, I would say that what we learned in this course actually was that migration is a benefit to the economy of the country. And I would say also that health care intervention is a benefit to the economy of the country. So I don't think we can afford not to uh, invest in health care for migrants and other similar groups it will be too costly in the long run. So let's give priority to this and argue for interventions that might help uh, migrants and others, but also might help um, uh, support the future economy of our country. Santino, any of those you want to touch? Yep. Can we also make questions? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry, they cannot see the list, so we are referring like first, second, third, but they don't know what we are talking about. Uh, the health shaping the migration policy agenda. Well, i like to, to, to reply here, really going straight away to practical examples. Uh, the uh, terrible mortality uh, in crossing the uh, central Mediterranean has been... Uh, encouraging community, international or national, to come up with policies to manage the phenomenon. Um, every day, the healthcare workers, the health, uh, health Ministry of Health, they are shaping up actions, immunization, screening. We were, you were on the, on the Wednesday uh, field trip, you see how the health actually shaping the action of the government. So I think it's pretty straightforward. The issue um, becomes a little bit more complex when we want to address the big picture, the global picture, where there the security or the uh, safe, orderly, uh, and regular migration to, uh, I mean, prevail 
to, to reassure member states uh, that nobody is going to suffer of the phenomenon and health become a little bit as a side effect. In reality, each country has somehow more or less health into their own constitution or into their own main legislative package. So the same situation is with migration health because here we are not talking about protecting the health of few privileged individuals. But here we are talking about protecting the population. So protecting the refugees and migrants, we are protecting our own, our own resident population. If I'm offering immunization to uh, just arrived uh, refugees and migrants, I'm protecting uh, the resident population. Yesterday in Sicily, there were two adults dying for measles. And this means that if we are not implementing the immunization policy and agenda, we are all at risk. And the two persons died, they were local people. Um, then uh, mainstreaming. What does mainstream refugee mean? Uh, or entails uh, the global, regional, and country, in the country agenda. Well, even there, I would like to uh, try to simplify. Mainstreaming to me means that when I'm mainstreaming the TB protocol, I'm supported by solid evidence and a standard of verity procedure which is, telling, which is telling me what I have to do at each stage. With migration health, still is a dimension of public health, probably I need to have solid principles and indication for actions in order to make sure that what we are doing is rational and evidence informed. That's my reading of mainstreaming when I'm, when I'm thinking about that. Uh, electronic data be stored. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> Sorry, but if we believe in universal health coverage, why do I need a, an ad hoc system to store data of patients? I ask you, I was going to make a question. If we believe that the system is supposed to be universal, sorry, you in the second line, if you're going to migrate to work at the University X in Northern Europe, do you need to carry with you an electronic device saying that you had a shot? So you have your own health system taking records and your doctor abroad is able to recall the information through official channel, country to country. So do, is that an indicator that we are passively accepting that we need to have an ad hoc public health for certain people and not for others. Sorry for the provocation. Um, I'm stopping here. No, actually, another question for Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> I've I lost control. <laughs> <laughs> I love Michaela, uh, uh, Scurs's presentation on the political dimension. I, I fully support that. I'm just in, in the deepest part of my mind thinking when all this happened. Uh, and if I'm trying to rationalize when, uh, I'm having a starting point coming to my mind, 2008, financial crisis. So, again, addressing the political decision, where, are we telling the entire story or maybe we should speak about also the financial crisis? If we never meet a financial crisis, would migration help be an issue? If there were not... Uh, influx coming to Europe, one of the richest parts of the world, but maybe going to south to south, would be that ever a political issue? Thank you very much. And I'm going to, while he's passing, you're, really, it is your prerogative. You are the coordinator of this program. And because of that, I can also say that he took the liberties of adding one more question because the questions flipped when people voted between Alan and Santino, so I'm going to tell you all the, the new question that he has pulled into the discussion so that you can also feed into that, and that is what does mainstreaming refugee and migrant health in global, regional, and country agendas look like and entail? What does mainstreaming refugee and migrant health in global, regional, and country agendas look like and entail? And six people would like to know the answer to this, and Alan would like to have the microphone back. Sorry. You sorry. see what you did. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry to intervene, but uh, I think mainstreaming uh, refugee and migrant health in the uh, general agendas also means to ensure that uh, health services are inclusive, are ready to, um, to, to, to care for everyone uh, by being diversity sensitive, 
by reducing all kinds of informal barriers, by um, having a, a, an objective to serve the population as a whole and not um, uh, the, the divide populations in some groups that have more rights and more access and better quality services than others. This, in my head, would be mainstreaming. <laughs> okay, I wanted to go back to a couple of things, and apologies for doing that. Um, so, so, um, so I wanted to uh, reflect back, and I'll come back to electronic systems in a minute, no worries with that. Um, but uh, whilst I have a chance to uh, talk about sustainably providing services for migrants as well, okay? Because, um, so, one of the things um, that is very close to my heart is um, having research that is actually applied, relevant, and is so enticing that policymakers can't do nothing but actually um, somehow acknowledge it and hopefully take it into their policies. There is an emerging body, and um, recently, I think, um, recent as last or this year, been published uh, in, in a number of countries, especially in Germany, about um, the cost effectiveness of including, excluding several types of migrants into the health system. So in Germany, of course, um, the big group of migrants they're concerned about is asylum seekers. And the German system has it that um, the entitlements and the access, well, the entitlements more than the access, in the initial phases of asylum seeking are s quite restricted, actually, I should say, initially. Um, and it takes some time to basically gain full access to, uh, to the health system. Uh, by doing so, um, uh, there is a great research, I think, from the University of Heidelberg and others that basically demonstrates that, um, that it's more cost effective to include them from day one into all the healthcare access than basically fuffing around uh, about this. Um, it's, it's just, it's a simple math. What we need to do is we need to not only produce more in different settings, we need to uh, do all that kind of stuff, but actually write it in a way that it's relevant and it cannot be ignored. That the health system said, actually, it's so overwhelming, let's just grant the access because it's much cheaper to do so. All right. So that's my answer to that uh, sustainability question. Because there's a, there's a view that basically, um, and people mix up two concepts, accounting and, and, econ uh, and economy. Um, accounting is basically just making sure the books are right, um, which I think is fair enough. But we need to look into the future. We need to look into the health economy. And it's actually more cost effective to uh, include them into uh, the healthcare system. Um, Okay, coming back to the, uh, to the health, electronic health uh, record systems. And there are a number of questions here. So the first question is, and I, I'd like to uh, come back to my friend Santino and, and, say, um, and say this. I agree with you, okay? Universal healthcare coverage, and you know, we're talking about mainstreaming and all that. Of course, we should have them in the main healthcare system. However, that's not the reality on the ground at the moment. And the reality on the ground at the moment is that, um, and the reason why um, uh, IOM has been commissioned by the EC actually um, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, help um, and support such a system is because health assessments, which is very often the first way of interaction with the health system, um, has been done um, in different countries, in different um, uh, reception centers, in as many ways that you can count. So there was complete heterogeneity and there was not enough recording and if the recording was done, it was actually lost. And that was the situation. So it's not actually that you know, we're crowding into a fantastic uh, you know, market of, um, of IT and uh, it's all there. It's basically, there was a huge gap. Um, what we need to do now, I believe, with for example the EPHR, is we need to ensure that it is interfaceable with the domestic systems, and that actually the data can be used. Technologically, no problem, because there is a format called XML, structured format, you can upload it into, into many systems. Politically, and uh, from a governance perspective, a much bigger issue. 
Okay, so that's, um, that's that. Which brings me to the second point, which is the question that was asked here, which was basically about, um, you know, how would the e-health data be stored and the impl implication about storing it on a government server. And it's very obvious um, why this is of concern to at least six people, maybe there's more now. Um, because, as I said before, as I said with a kitchen knife, data can be abused. And so um, um, you are all aware of, for example, um, the, um, uh, the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, which has now been suspended in uh, the UK of sharing of health data, this was primary care data, normal primary care GP data, um, with the, um, uh, uh, with the um, 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 Ministry of uh, Interior or the uh, Home Office, as we call it. Um, and of course, that's, that's, we, we all agree that's, that's, that cannot happen or should not happen. However, um, what we, um, so what we need to do is put safeguards into place. And these safeguards, um, have a lot of it is electronic, okay? so it's firewalls, it's... Uh, uh, secure servers, it's access controls, it's ensuring that the right people can only access the right information, and a lot has happened there. We could put the applicant in, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the uh, asylum seeker in uh, uh, charge of his or her own records by, for example, having a biometrics um, um, uh, access control in there, for example, or a unique number, or whatever. There are many ideas. So that's, that's one thing, and then there is a second question, which is the legal level about these kind of things. So can they and should they? Um, the unique place that we have as IOM, as a UN organization, is that we are slightly outside of any uh, particular state. So at the moment, for example, EPHR is uh, stored, should I say, for lack of better words, on, uh, on IOM premises. So, uh, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's not actually with any particular member state. But of course, with the approval and with the full granting uh, of, of rights by the member state. Thank you very much. You can pass it to Michaela. Ah, thank you. So, what would I reply? I would say engage, participate, rethink, and reframe. That would be my response. And I, what do I mean by that? I mean, I think to, one, to some extent the health sector and shaping migration policy and mainstreaming is a little bit coming together for me because it basically means you need, the health sector needs to engage, as I've said. You need to engage. And you need to engage actually in migration venues. But you also need to engage in human rights venues. And that also is all about, you know, at the different levels. So it is all about different venues and be present, engage and voice. Uh, your um, issues, concerns, demand. Um, and I think in, in engaging and in being the different venues, you know, what it also means is, of course it also means a, at the national level, a whole of government approach. And we all know health in all policy, that's the mainstreaming tool, so there it is, health in all policy. But did we ever hear about migration in all policies? So maybe we need to create migration in all policies. And is that enough? No, it's not enough. Because that remains within the governmental level. It's about a whole of society approach. So it is actually that all the society needs to participate. So I think that for me is mainstreaming, but it also means that you need to also rethink the way you actually engage and where you engage and in which ways you engage. So I think that, that is about the engage, participate, and rethink. And to, to some extent, you also need to reframe then, because if you talk about competing budgetary limitations or finances and competing priorities, the question then is how do you reframe? And I think it comes back what Alan said in terms of, you know, reframe it in a positive way. So it's a contribution. It's not a threat. It's an opportunity. So there is something in it for you. There is something in it for each and everybody of us. And there's also something in it for, for the, the trade people and the foreign policy people and the, you know, the, the different ministries. So you just need to reframe that and you need to adjust and tailor-made your message to that audience. And I think that makes a big difference then because then you can set priorities in a different way. So that's one part. I think one other part is the, the whole electronic data data storage, and of course, for me, there's always this, the question, and you, you just talked, and I just picked you up on that, because you mentioned the rights of, it remains within the rights of the member state. 
Now, of course, do we actually then build a new surveillance system here? Is it really the rights of the member states or is it the right of the patient or the right of the migrant and the ownership? Who owns the data? What is the regulatory framework here? Who owns the data? Is it the member state, really? Or shouldn't that be the patient or the migrant? You, saw, you said both, but you did <laughs> also say the rights of the member state. So I pick selective picking, you know? Um, so, okay. And then finally, the question from Santino. Right, you're right. Yeah, of course it's about financial crisis as well, and of course it's also about a political context. And if you look at the far-right movement in Europe, it hasn't started yesterday. It has started back in the 90s. So it's nothing new. It, it actually happened at the time of the financial crisis, and that's how it started. And let me just go back to something which also links back into the migration policies here and EU politics, and that's Frontex. Recall how Frontex has been... Um, established, developed, at what time, yeah? So, what I think is also that we need to learn, and that's another message from me, is to lean, can we learn actually from history? Do we learn from history? In which ways do we learn from history? Because if you look at Frontex, and I remember when I was really responsible of the migration portfolio at that time, with the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement in the Federation, actually, um, we had that major discussion about detention centers in the Ukraine, set up by the European Union in the Ukraine. Now it's called reception centers. And of course, terminology has changed, discourse has changed, but it, in principle, it's just about the same thing. You know, keep your borders, protect your, person, your internal flows. But how did actually Frontex came about? It's also very interesting to look in that history, in that negotiation history, if you want. Because it came about after 9-11, so it was a security debate, clearly. 9-11, security, 2001, 2002, actually Frontex, the discussions have started by about three or four member states, Germany, Italy, you know, they started actually about those, at, about that discussion, Belgium. Now, it was a process of negotiation over two or three years. But what has shaped that discussion was ultimately not the security debate. So it started with the security debate, but then later on it wasn't about securing borders. And if you look at the mandate of Frontex, it's also about the man it's actually management. It's about management of external borders through cooperation. Yeah, it has been revised in 2007, but in the early days that was what it was about. Now that is a very different discourse. It wasn't about security. And still, what happened? 2004. What happened politically in Europe, which shaked Europe? Anybody knows? It was the Madrid bombings. Remember? So that's actually, that, that shaked Europe. It was a security threat. Of course, there were Moroccan involved, but it, they didn't talk about Moroccans being involved. They didn't, talk about, they didn't talk about actually a migrant debate. They didn't even talk about security at the time. It was very interesting. But what the Madrid bombing did, was in fact to give an impetus to create and increase a political will to act. So the debate didn't change. It didn't change back into a security debate to develop you know, Frontex as a security issue or as a security agency. I mean, we can then discuss what, what it actually does. But in terms of its wording and its mandate, it's about management of external borders through cooperation. So it didn't actually change that debate, but it triggered a political will to find a solution and to actually finish because that discussion over two or three years was in a deadlock. The metric bombing actually triggered off the political will to find a solution. In 2005, there you had established Frontex. Thank you all. Next round of questioning. Does anybody in the room want to ask a question? You get first dibs. Okay, we're going to go back to Slido then. Yes, one bit. Oh, great, terrific. Can you take her a microphone? Fatima Masrikan from the Public Health Agency from Sweden. I have one question because uh, we have been focusing on something really relevant, that is, uh, it should be evidence, evidence, evidence. But what about uh, fact resistance in the society? Uh, so we have a lot of knowledge, maybe, 
in the future. But uh, what uh, we have learned also the late years is that there is a factor resistance in the societies. So what are your reflections about this upcoming situation? How do we navigate in the post-truth era? Any other questions in the room? We have a nice follow-up question that Michaela already started to scratch the surface on, but I want to give our other ones also a chance, and you may want to add to it as well. We often discuss what providers can do, doctors, social workers, etc. but how can we engage the average citizen and local populations in migrant health promotion? How do we engage the average citizen and local populations in migrant health promotion? I think we have done sustainability. The other question, Michaela, you get a nod for a good talk here. Uh, it's what it says. Uh, great talk, actually, sorry. Um, media and communications are more powerful than other solutions you propose. How do we get media on our side to bring about political change? There's an interesting question. How do we get media on our side to bring about political change? So we're going to take those three questions. I, I dare give up my microphone, but I think I might just to Alan. Don't you pass it to Santino. <laughs> I got one. <laughs> <laughs> grab it and keep it. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the first question that was asked, and how do we engage, engage uh, the average citizen uh, in migrant health uh, promotion. And I recall a visit I did a, a few years ago. I visited a municipality in the suburbs of Copenhagen with a very large proportion of immigrants, uh, and also a very large proportion of elderly immigrants. And we were taken to uh, um, facility uh, the municipal facility for elderly people where they could uh, act out their uh, interests, uh, they could uh, do exercise, they could do quick cooking, they could have games, they could do all kinds of things. And uh, surprisingly, uh, when, we when we looked at the participants there, there was not one representative of the immigrant population. Mm, all of them were were, uh, were uh, native Danes. And uh, we asked, where are the, where are the immigrants? Uh, why don't they participate? And the municipal uh, uh, people responsible said, well, we are also a bit uh, sorry about that, but it's hard to cope with. And I think that, that is the question, I mean, and the issue. You need to um, develop your facilities and create platforms for interaction between the different groups in your community. And uh, probably they, uh, they, they develop this facility based on uh, oh, traditional Danish uh, uh, norms and values and how things were used to be done. Uh, cooking uh, the, the traditional Danish food and serving this and playing original Danish uh, uh, card games and whatever without taking into account that now we have a large proportion of our community which are uh, from other parts of the world with other norms and values and interests. So I think what they could be done is to change this framework and then create platforms for interaction between the different groups. And I think this would engage them if they meet, if they have daily relationships uh, in, a, uh, in a framework which is constructive and health promoting, then I think we have succeeded doing what we need to do. Usually when we get to know each other, it takes care of itself sometimes, doesn't it? Right. Who else wants to reflect on these questions? <laughs> <laughs> Once I get a chance. <laughs> The fact resistance is something that worries me very much also. Um, I'm a very evidence-based, um, you know, freak almost. Um, and I, I believe in trying to generate evidence. What we need to try and do is understand better what talks to policymakers. That means that actually, um, and I was quite um, heartened by a colleague uh, this morning, we had a very brief discussion who told me that actually 
they invite the journalists at the inception of a research study. Not at the end, not at dissemination stage, but at the inception of the study and try and gauge their views and try and, and understand um, what it is that uh, they would uh, uh, like to, to um, uh, what's on their hearts. Um, I think we need, we need to raise the, the game uh, in, in communication about research and we need to get better at this. Tweeting about uh, a Lancet article isn't good enough anymore. So um, I don't know exactly how that would look like, but I think it is very close to my heart and it's something to do with the way that we, uh, with the relevance of the research itself and the way that we communicate that research back into the public. Kayla would like your microphone. Yeah, so just some reflections. And that's really, my question then is, and I mean, fact resistance, it's there. And it's there because we have fake news. And so what is the truth? What is right, what is right and wrong? What is real news and what is wrong news? We don't know anymore. But for me, the question then is, you know, yes, you have to keep on your evidence and you have to share that evidence. But my question is, why is that resistance? Why? Have you ever asked why? What, what is the purpose of that resistance? And so how can you turn it around where you put yourself into the shoes of the person who resists? And think, why is that pers person to resist? And then create your argument so that he cannot resist anymore because you put yourself in the shoes and therefore you speak that language in a different way. So you know, you provide your data and you provide your the evidence in a different way. So put yourself in the shoes of the other in order to understand where that person comes from. Because only then you actually can change the debate and turn it around. And in some ways for me that's also around, you know, media is really powerful. Media needs to be an ally, and I think often we also forget to work with media. And Christy, you're a much better place to respond to that, so maybe that's <laughs> really a question to you. But I mean, I really feel, you know, tell the story of Mohammed and Benny. Because media, if we put ourselves into the shoes of media, what does media do? They want readership. They're really eager to have readers. They want to get a message out. So how do you actually attract that attention? Well, tell the story. Tell the story of Mohammed and Benny. Because that is where you become powerful. Because media also draws on emotions. They don't draw on evidence. Evidence might come in at some point, <laughs> but they also need to attract the readership. So I think that's where you have to engage in a different way and where we need to engage as well. We need to engage with media much more regularly. Provide them with the information. Provide them with the evidence. Let's not give up on that. Yeah? But we need to tell them also the stories, because then they can actually come out with a story in a different way, because otherwise they get the stories from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I actually will jump in on the media question, just because I spent 20 years of my life uh, covering health and medical news. Uh, media is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, never think that the media is on your side. That, that's the piece of that question that, that, that jumped at me. The media has a job to do. Uh, and the media is not necessarily there to help you do your job. The media represents a group of people, their audience, and it is a very specific audience. And in that sense, they're almost a focus group. So if you can find a way, go into what you just said, connecting to the values of certain people. People make up their minds and their beliefs on their values, and if you can connect into what's relevant to them, then the media might be interested in amplifying or talking about what you're doing, but people shy away from the media because they're afraid of a negative story, and that's not good. Uh, I mean, media is also there to hold us accountable, uh, and that's, that's a very important role in this society, especially in this society of post-truth, uh, as you're saying. Uh, so media is a powerful tool, and they're, they're, they're a group of people to be worked with. They're just like us. Uh, and they can give us really good feedback, like you were saying, uh, of what the community is interested in. I mean, their job is to represent a piece of the community, whether it's virtual or physical. Uh, so so they're, they're a very helpful um, informant that way to, to guide us in what people are, are most interested in. That's my thoughts on media. You're going to go? 
Yeah, well, I'd like to comment on the question of the colleague from Sweden and uh, how we can address facts. And uh, on the comment of Michaela that sometimes we are really not using enough the history. Uh, the issue is, in my view, if we want to change the narrative, uh, we need to act in organized manner. My feeling is that we are always uh, running after. We are always shooting moving target. Today I love the intervention of Peter when I ask, okay, how uh, evidence could be able to help us? Well, we're supposed to be responsive. We're supposed to be able to follow the facts. But the facts also need to be uh, bear in mind that are utilized by common people. In my view, we are not good to outreach the society, the, 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 the community and the educational sector. In my view, the cultural diversity is supposed to be uh, something addressed at the early stage of our life, at all level of our society. We tend to discuss those things only when a problem arises, not as a normal fact. Uh, I remember with a bit uh, of uh, uh, like this nice note, uh, a survey done uh, with uh, uh, kids at school in a mixed classroom where they were interviewing, they were surveying the, the national kids to indicate on the map where the person next seat was coming from. And they were not able even to place it on the map. So imagine how much is there to, to be filled up in terms of information or bust, busting false myth. Then if we historically, the link with history, we are accepting, we, we, we are, we are uh, flagging the fact that the current national state arrangement, the border control, nationality, is actually a middle age a middle age uh, uh, political setting, and nothing has been changed uh, from, from that moment, where basically we tend to divide ourselves according to our nationality. Um, so it's, it's le really a long process which cannot be addressed only by health sector when we are having an unequal approach uh, because of the reason that can be at that moment, but we need to really start to work with all sectors. Any other comments? questions from the room. We have time for one last round of questions on the fourth row back. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Bonilla and I work at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. I'm following up on I think what Michaela was saying. I think part of the story too here that seems to get lost sometimes in the discussions is that there are opportunity costs to decisions that are made on both sides in making investments to improve the life of migrants, um, and the challenges that national, regional, and local governments face as well, um, especially in very economic contexts. Um, so I think part of this story that needs to come out is how, are, how can people demonstrate that there are benefits coming out of the investments that are made to migrants, and not just looking at them as costs? That's a good question. Any other questions in the room? All right, I'm going to look down here and see if there's last two questions. Migration is a global phenomenon, and the majority of corridors, cor corridors, thank you, <laughs> corridors are intra-regional. Yet most solutions at the moment are at country level. This is a dichotomy. Uh, I will let any of you reflect on that one that wants to reflect on that. Uh, and finally, in the context of increasing, uh, we had this one before, but clearly they're not satisfied with our answers. <laughs> in the context of increasing rationing of health services, budgetary constraints, and so on, how can we sustainably provide services for migrants and refugees? So you guys get another shot at sustainability because you have not passed that test yet, apparently. Um, who wants to start? And we're going to practice our sound bites because we have nine minutes left. So I need short answers, please. I can touch up on the budget cut. Well, this is, a, again, half true story, or at least a, we are touching upon very, uh, really in surfi on, on surface. Um, a country, the health system of a country needs to be tailored according to the population into the country. So you can have budget cut, you can have budget reallocation, but at the end of the day, there is a subsidiarity element where 
the objective is to protect the health of the, your population and the health system need to be able to address that, those things. So I will not be really uh, putting the level of discussion because I'm cutting the budget, so I'm cutting the access for this group of population. The health system needs to act as one entity and need to be able to adjust according to the resources available for the entire population. That's the subsidiarity, the responsibility of the government. And don't forget the how can we show some of the benefits question that came from the room from Paul. But that, that's, that's uh, the issue, I think, to show the benefits and to, to make sure that it is clear for those who are making priorities that the investment in health is actually valuable. I think, uh, it, I think it's quite obvious <laughs> to some of us, but uh, when the obvious is not always the obvious for, for everyone. And, uh, and we need uh, evidence, and even if we have evidence, there are counter arguments, of course. But I think increasingly we have documentation that it is, that it is valuable for the society to invest in health uh, care and give it a reasonable priority. And if it's done in an unequal way, then it has negative consequences, not only for the health of those who suffer, but for society in general. The more equity, the more uh, harmonized con uh, population, the better wealth of the, uh, of, the, of the country. I think that's a fact that has been quite clear after uh, f research and uh, historical experiences. Those countries who ha have the um, least inequity are those who are having the best uh, wealth and uh, growth. And I think this is a strong argument that should be put forward again and again. And we have to make media and journalists and politicians and decision makers on every level um, realize that this is the actual um, reality. Thank you, Alan. And uh, just to, uh, to add to that, I think that the whole argument of rationalization reminds me of a um, cinema that has a number of spaces and has a number of tickets, and once the spaces are sold out, the cinema is full, and that's that. A health economy is not like that. A health economy is flexible and has got many choices. Yes, there are um, countries that have less money and other countries that have more money. Well, our current footprint here is, is Europe and in many parts of Europe, especially in the EUEA, I would argue there is enough money to balance the books, so to speak, for the, for the health economy is a whole different question of whether then that is cost effective, which is what I was alluding to. And yes, it is. I can, I'm making that point again because it's such an important point. It is more cost effective to include uh, migrants into the health economy fully. Um, and, and I don't want to repeat what Alan has just said. I just want to fully agree with you um, that basically, you know, we, we look at those aspects, but we need to get that out of our mind. We need to get that cinema um, with a, a number of spaces out of our heads um, in the economic, in the health economic system. There's choices that we are making, spending it on defense or spending it on health. That's a choice. It's a political choice. It can be made. Okay, I should stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Dominic. I don't need to talk now anymore. But I mean, I think just to build on the investment, yes, and we have heard that, and I think there's sufficient research to show that that is actually a good investment. And the question is for me, why is that research not heard? So that's coming back actually to your the question from Sweden as well. You know, why is that fact? Why is there that resistance? So I think we just need to explore that. And it's, it is definitely that we need to, yes, we need to also talk that language of investment. And, and WHO is starting that with the investment case. And of course, also is going to be criticized about that because it's not just about an economic body anymore. So there you also have a critical element in there. But at the same time, I think we need to also ask, why is it not heard? Why is that message not heard? Because it's there. But it's because it's a political choice, because it, it doesn't want to be heard, because the electorate yeah, is very 
is is actually very absorbing, likes to absorb the bad message, yeah, because well, it's good and it's good then for the politicians. So it's it's where the electorate comes in, where the citizens, we as citizens, come in. I think so. That's where we have that responsibility, and I think it's about the selective perception as well, because it's, it's selective perception. I mean, it's as you know, Dominic did say that the, the rights are with the the patients, and I, but he did also say the rights is with member states. So I I did the selective. I did something very selective here, and that's that's what is happening all the time. Yeah, so that's where we need to be cautious, and we have to call upon them and say, no, it's not that. It's about that. Um, I just want to otherwise respond to maybe the question around this interregional versus country level, because uh, maybe that hasn't been addressed in that same way. So I think it does show us that it is, you know, yes, it's about country level, and whatever we do at the regional or global level has an impact on country level. And of course, it also shows you it is inter migration is interregional more and more. So it's not, and that is actually going back to my earlier message. It's about a collective action. It's about shared responsibility. You cannot solve it alone, and that you cannot do in global health, and you cannot do it in migration. You cannot solve it alone as a country. Yes, you can protect your borders, but ultimately, you cannot solve the issue alone. You need others to get involved, and that's where actually diplomacy comes in. We need to engage with others and we need to get into that diplomatic relationship so to speak it's about that building that relationships about you know negotiating that relationship negotiating what that and what it entails but it's also about smart sovereignty because very often actually people would say well countries would say well we are a sovereign state don't get involved yeah sorry so it's about smart sovereignty. And what do I mean by that? It's about being smart about your sovereignty. It's not to challenge that the country is sovereign in what they do. But it's about being smart to find a solution nevertheless together. Because it will strengthen your own sovereignty actually. It still will strengthen your national interest. Because if you have that interregional movement, you still want to actually have, you benefit if you collaborate cross region. And I think it is in that way that we need actually to once again trigger a different perspective on, you know, a sovereignty debate, for example. Thank you very much, Michaela, Dominique, Santino, and Alan. Thank you all online and thank you in the audience. If I can just uh, first apologize to the questions that we did not get to. I saw Santino looking there just a minute ago and I thought he was going to extend us for another two hours to continue asking the questions. Um, but uh, we are out of time, so I do apologize for those we did not get to. If I can summarize, I think it's uh, been a very enlightening 90 minutes. I mean, we, it, it really plays on to what we saw uh, and heard all week long about uh, the idea of migration. It will always exist. Uh, and the inequities in health will be problematic if we don't figure this out. Um, we've got to find out how we master integration and mainstreaming, and we've got the tools to guide us to help us do that, but the oper 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 putting the tools into action, <laughs> thank you, uh, putting the tools into action uh, is going to take human beings. And uh, it was a strong call to action uh, today from this panel. Uh, that it's not just governments or just civil society or just migrants or just communities, it's everybody, uh, that everybody has an action to take and we all must get involved. So thank you all very much for your time and I will turn it back over to the boss here in the middle. <laughs>